national death comparisons, two of the countries who've performed the worst during this pandemic, despite our sophisticated healthcare systems, are the United States and the UK. Why? There are now more than 10 million people in Britain living under tight restrictions. Meanwhile, America has hit a record high in infections. This morning, among others, I will be speaking to Dr Anthony Fauci, President Trump's most senior coronavirus advisor. Just nine days out from the US election, Dr. Fauci talks to me about President Trump's COVID strategy and that of his opposition, Joe Biden. I'll be looking at the situation here with Professor Sir Ian Diamond, the head of the ONS. And as the government comes under increasing pressure to provide free school meals during the holidays to Brandon Lewis, the Northern Ireland secretary. Wales is into the first few days of another full national lockdown, and I'll be talking to the health minister there, Vaughan Gethin. <music> Reviewing a busy morning's news, Helen Lewis from The Atlantic and the BBC's political correspondent, Leila Nathu. Before all of that, we've got the news headlines from Ben Thompson. Andrew, thank you. Good morning. The government is facing mounting pressure of its decision not to extend its meal vouchers scheme for children from low-income backgrounds during the school holidays. More than 2,000 doctors, including many leading paediatricians, have written an open letter to the Prime Minister calling for him to reverse the decision. The government says a further £1 billion has been made available to local councils to support low-income families. The Welsh Government has said it will review its ban on supermarkets selling non-essential items following calls for the decision to be reversed. Items such as cooking equipment and clothes were no longer available to shoppers when new restrictions came into force on Friday. More than 40,000 people have now signed a petition for the ban to be lifted. The isolation period for those who've been in contact with someone who has tested positive for coronavirus could be reduced. At the moment, people must quarantine for 14 days, but ministers are considering shortening that to 10 or 7 days. That's after senior Conservative backbencher Sir Bernard Jenkin criticised the effectiveness and leadership of the test and trace system. Britain's oldest person, Joan Hockard, has died in her Dorset care home at the age of 112. Born in 1908, she was a keen sailor and drove an ambulance during the Second World War. Speaking to the BBC earlier this year, Joan said she had no secret to her long life, but enjoyed butter and cream and scoffed at the idea of dieting. That's all from me for now. The next news on BBC One is at one o'clock. Andrew, back to you. Butter and cream, that is the best news for a very long time. And now, as ever, to the front pages of the papers, where there are so many stories, it's almost bewildering. The Sunday Times is a very, very disturbing story here, alleging that the elderly have paid a terrible price for protecting the NHS from COVID. We will be talking about that in great detail later on, I'm sure. The Sunday Telegraph has the story you heard in the news there, suggesting that isolation for test and trace could be halved from 14 days to seven, or maybe 10 days. And again, we'll be talking about that. The Sunday Express focuses on how the rest of us are behaving or not behaving. Ministers fear Christmas virus rebels. In other words, people have had enough and will not be doing what they're told to over the festive season. The Mail on Sunday is a cheering story, again, if true, a cheering story, saying that the NHS staff are going to get a vaccine within weeks, they say. That's echoing Donald Trump, of course, who was saying the same thing in America recently. And The Observer has a, uh, carrying on with the Marcus, Raff, uh, Marcus Rashford story. Top children's doctors, paediatricians and stuff from around the country are attacking the Conservatives over the free school meals issue. Finally, uh, you heard about Wales in, in the news uh, headlines there. And there is Wales on Sunday. And they are saying that Mark Drakeford, the First Minister of Wales, is going to do a U-turn on that policy later on. I'll be talking to Vaughan Gethin, his health secretary, to see if that's true later in the programme. But lots to talk about. Leila, let's start with you. And I guess 
the, the, the Marcus Rashford story, one way or another, has gripped the whole country, hasn't it? Yes, pressure definitely building on the government today to change their minds over extending free school meals into the school holidays. Remember, there was that Commons vote on Wednesday, all but five Tory MPs voted not to extend the policy. The Observer uh, front page goes with uh, more than 2,000 children's doctors uh, adding to that pressure on the government. Uh, and the Mail describes it as Tories in turmoil over Marcus Rashford, Marcus Rashford's campaign. I mean, I think the risk of the government, they're looking out of step with the public on this. The Mail points to 71% of voters backing Marcus Rashford. He's an incredibly popular figure. So is there a little bit of, as it were, buyer's remorse by some Conservative MPs, do you think, at this stage? Yes, definitely privately speaking to some Tory MPs. They are extremely anxious about how this is coming across. Yes. They're extremely anxious about why this wasn't anticipated. Because remember, there was a U-turn on this very policy before exactly. the summer holidays. So many are asking why the government didn't foresee this coming around again and why they didn't have a proper plan in place. Um, and another footballer, Raheem Sterling, is now entering the fray in, again, a way that will cheer a lot of people up. He's a very, very well-paid man. Yes, uh, a lot of people will be extremely happy to hear what Raheem Sterling's plans are for a charity. He's a, a Manchester City, a rival Manchester footballer uh, to Marcus Rashford, saying that he wants to set up a charity to help deprived children and to focus on social mobility. Uh, very interesting, I think, to see this activism coming from these young footballers at this time and focusing on policies that actually resonate with their own personal experiences. If you're a minister, you don't take on footballers lightly. Uh, Helen Lewis, let me turn to the, the big story in the Sunday Times. Times, which is all across the front page, and then pages and pages and pages of detail inside. Yes, they've certainly given it um, some welly. So this is the idea that over 80s were essentially triaged out of being either admitted to intensive care or in some cases to hospital altogether during the early phase of the pandemic, the, the so-called first wave. You know, the government's really pushed back very strongly on this. But one thing that has been very apparent is that during that first period of the coronavirus, some pretty big errors of judgment now, it looks in retrospect, were made, both about discharging elderly people from care, into care homes from hospitals and taking COVID with them. And then also, you know, the idea of the Nightingale hospitals, which were built and much lauded, and then only ended up treating really a few dozen people. So you ended up with a situation where routine operations were cancelled, you know, there were intensive care beds free, but people were dying at home. And the ONS figures are very clear on this, you know, there are tens of thousands of excess deaths at home during that period. So I think this is a story that is going to rumble on despite the denials, because clearly lots of people feel that their loved ones were not treated very well, particularly when you think about the number of people in that very early phase who died alone, who weren't allowed you know, relatives in to see them. Perhaps they had to FaceTime in to, to say goodbye to their grandmothers or grandfathers. It's one of those stories, if true, very disturbing indeed. Uh, Professor Stephen Powis, the NHS National Medical Director, I should tell you, says these untrue claims will be deeply offensive to NHS doctors, nurses, therapists, and paramedics. The Sunday Times assertions are simply not borne out to the facts, and there's much more of that to come. Nevertheless, you know, as Helen was saying, Leila, um, if this story has resonance up and down the country with actual families who remember elderly relatives, it will run, and if not, not. And I think that that is a problem for ministers now, because any lingering doubts over the handling of the pandemic, the policies that were put in place right at the start, affects people's attitudes towards what they're being asked to do at this, po at this moment in the pandemic. And I think that, that is, uh, there are a lot of questions still for the government to answer about what went on in those early days. Staying with coronavirus, I think probably the most important story for an awful lot of people will be the front page splash of the Sunday Telegraph there, saying that the isolation uh, period for people... Uh, suspected of having coronavirus, which was 14 days of self-isolation, may be cut to seven days. Yeah, we've been told that the 14-day isolation period has been absolutely crucial to containing the spread of the virus for some time because you can still be asymptomatic in that period and therefore go about spreading the virus if you weren't isolating. Now we're told that actually because of fears of over-compliance, according to The Telegraph, there are plans to potentially cut that isolation period down. So whether this is a departure from the science or whether this is something that the science has changed on. We'll have to see. But I think uh, it's interesting to see that isolation is being highlighted here because it seems that isolation has been the weak link all along. We've been a lot of focus on test and trace, about the testing and tracing system. But if you're testing and tracing people, but they're not isolating, it doesn't really matter how many people you're, you're testing and tracing. Absolutely right. But if they start to cut the number of days, if it's not, it doesn't have to be 14 days or 10 or 7, then lots of people think, well, I'm not going to self-isolate at all. It's clearly not necessary. That's the danger for them, I guess. Absolutely. That there are doubts 
doubts then creeping in about the policy. And you've got some uh, highlighted the Telegraph also highlighting some Tory concerns, growing Tory dissent over the test and trace system, more broadly calling for a change of leadership, a direct challenge to Matt Hancock, the Secretary of State, who's backed Dido Harding, who's in charge of test and trace uh, very strongly. But interesting to hear uh, more Tory criticism of the handling of the test and trace system and the centralisation of it, adding to those calls we've been hearing all along for test and trace to be put more in local hands. Helen, let me turn to you directly about this issue of how people behave, because the more arguments there are in politics about the, the truth of the science and what's being done and so forth, the less people are likely to be obedient, as it were. And that's really the theme of the, the front page of the Sunday Express this morning. Yeah, and it's the theme of the, the last six months. I mean, take the you know guidance on mask wearing, for example, which was deemed not necessary right up until the moment that it's absolutely necessary and everybody has to do it all the time. And I think that's made it really confusing for people you know, to try and keep up. I think the vast majority of people want to do the right thing, but it's very hard to when the right thing seems to be changing. I mean, I don't think in this case the science has changed in terms of that symptomatic period. It's just a case of there's no point having, you know, you can have all the aspirations in the world, but if, if people aren't complying with them, there's, there's no point to a 14 day quarantine period that people simply aren't obeying. Other strange little story on this related note is the idea there might be an exemption for the city boys flying in and out of the country for, for meetings, which I think is a, has a potential to become another one of those little pinpricks in the side of the government that just speak to whether or not it's kind of in touch with, you know, what the, the majority of the country. Absolutely. Uh, Leila, let me t I mentioned the Welsh story um, earlier on. I showed the Wales on Sunday front page there. Um, can we remind ourselves what the Welsh government thought it was doing by banning people from buying some things and not other things? It was meant to protect smaller shops, I think, originally, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah, so during this 17 day so-called firebreak lockdown that has now come in into force in Wales, non-essential items from supermarkets were not to be brought. And this was, as you say, to protect other shops which have been forced to close under this lockdown, but also, I think, to stop people milling about unnecessarily for having a day out, perhaps, in the supermarket rather than just focusing on what they need to buy. Now, obviously, there's been some backlash to, what, to this. We've seen the pictures of taped off aisles with birthday cards out of reach, uh, pans and pots, Tupperwares, that sort of thing. Who is to decide what is essential and what is not? We had a bit of this, I think, in the spring when police forces were getting involved in policing supermarket aisles. But some hint from Mark Drakeford that he is reconsidering. Yeah. Um, in terms of the policy, as between very unpopular hugely unpopular and fantastically unpopular. It's at the polysyllabic end of that scale. I think, I think that's fair, fair to say. say. Yes. yes, yes. All right, let's turn to another huge story this morning, uh, Helen. Huge story around the world, which is, of course, the US presidential race. And there is a sense that in London, a lot of people are looking at Biden's lead in the polls over Donald Trump and beginning to wonder whether they've backed the wrong horse. Yes, I mean, this has been something that's been bubbling away for a long time. But really, the consensus has hardened around the fact that the gap in the polls is so big that, you know, if it continues, Biden is on course for victory. Now, the US polling site 538 gives Trump a one in eight victory chance at the moment. So don't count him out. You know, this, there Never have been polling upsets out. before. Mm. But nonetheless, what's happened, I think, is a certain level of, of panic among people. Also, not just the British government. Actually, I think Facebook in the last couple of weeks, with its ban on Holocaust denial and QAnon, the conspiracy groups, has also had a slight panic about the fact that a Biden regulatory regime wouldn't be very friendly to it. And I think exactly the same problem has happened here, that there's been a lot of effort put into wooing Donald Trump over a trade deal and not so much into Joe Biden. And now he has Irish roots. He has spoken about the fact that the good Friday agreement is very important to him. However, I do have one piece of optimism from today's papers, which is from Liam Fox in the Sunday Telegraph, who says if Trump loses, he thinks that he might work through the details and, and, and a US-UK trade deal might become a gift for Biden at the beginning of his administration, which sounds like a very accurate read on what will happen to Donald Trump if he, if he loses the election. Very, very interesting indeed. And of course, Joe Biden was also somebody who criticised Brexit back in the day as well. And I'm sure number 10 has noted that. Um, there's one other story we haven't talked about. There's so many stories to talk about later this morning. But this notion that the vaccine might be available for NHS staff within a few weeks will encourage a huge number of people. We're all waiting for that. Yes, there's been various doubts about when the vaccine is going to be ready. But I think the idea that NHS workers will be prioritised for it, that would have been something that will, many people would have been calling for. And the idea that it, we're only weeks away from it is clearly a huge source of encouragement. Leila and Helen, thanks both very much indeed for that. And so to the weather. Well, for once, the gods seem to be working with government ministers who want to keep us in our houses. Glancing out of the window, you might ask why anyone rational would want to leave the house in the first place. Over to Stav Darnes. Stav. 
Thank you very much, Andrew. Yes, indeed. The clocks went back last night, marking the end of British summertime. And in the, the next few days really are going to feel very autumnal. Low pressure nearby, sunshine and showers sort of play through the day today. Some of these showers will continue to be heavy with hail and thunder, particularly across the south of the country. Here's the culprit, low pressure to the northwest of the UK. Some of the showers merging together to produce longer spells of rain for western Scotland and towards Northern Ireland. Lots of showers across the south and the west too. But probably the best of the sunshine and driest of the weather will be across the the east of England, northeast England, eastern Scotland. These are the mean wind speeds, so a blustery day. We could see gusts touching 50 miles an hour across western Scotland. And it'll also feel a bit chillier today than it did yesterday. Highs of 10 to maybe 14 degrees in the southeast. A blustery showery night tonight, and then tomorrow we'll continue with the sunshine and showers. Wind's not quite as strong tomorrow, and there's just signs of something a little bit drier across Scotland with lighter winds as we head on into the afternoon. More of the showers will be further south. Again, similar temperatures, 10 to 13 or 14 degrees across the south. But it stays very unsettled as we move through the week. Atlantic lows sweeping in, bringing spells of wet and windy weather. And just signs of something a little bit milder pushing up from the southwest across England and Wales by the time we reach the end of the week. That's all from me. Back to you, Andrew. Thanks a lot. Spare a thought for people trying to build bonfires at the moment, both rather damp and being blown away at the same time. Now, Professor Sir Ian Diamond is the National Statistician and Head of the Office for National Statistics. His job is to provide facts on what's happening in the UK in a confusing landscape of claims and counterclaims about the state of the pandemic. Now, he also sits on SAGE, the main body that advises the government on COVID-19. After a week in which some papers were reporting there is no second wave, while others predict tens of thousands of deaths to come, I asked him just before we came on air, what's the truth? Well, I think there's no question uh, we are in uh, a second wave. Uh, we are seeing infections rise very quickly. Uh, our most recent data show a rate for England of uh, a little over 0.8 uh, of a percent. That's the highest we have recorded since we started uh, recording. And that means around about one in 130 people uh, in England have the virus. Um, and we are now able to do estimates for, for Scotland, for Wales and for Northern Ireland. Scotland and Wales a little lower, but uh, and Northern Ireland just at the moment a little higher, but all in the same place. Well, staying with the data, I noticed that quite a lot of the indicators we saw on Friday suggest that the growth in cases is already starting to slow down. R is down and the growth rate of infections is down. Does that mean that we may be uh, leaving this second wave earlier than we feared? I do. I, I'd very much like to, to, to hope so. However, I am extremely nervous about taking just initial data um, and... Uh, pushing things forward and say it, it's fine because um, let, let's be clear we, we might see the rate of increase slow a little as we we get further data over the next few weeks but we're still at a relatively high level what we really need to do is to bring that level down uh, and even if um, we were to get R in the north uh, to around about one it would continue to have infections at a high rate so, so I, think, I really do think uh, it's too early relax, to say uh, on slowing down, but we'll be keeping you know, really a close uh, and accurate watch on it. I suppose the other thing to say is that back at the start of April, first wave, there were 2,500 people at one point on ventilators, and now there's 700 people on ventilators, which again suggests that the death rate may be much lower this time around. I, I, again, I, I hope and pray so, um, Andrew, but we also, as I say, we have much better data on infections now. So therefore, we have much better data earlier in uh, the, the second wave than we had in the first wave. Uh, and uh, we will now be doing everything we can uh, as, as a nation to prevent those hospitalizations uh, getting onto ventilators. And as I say, uh, our brilliant doctors know an awful lot more about how to handle this virus than, of course, they did in the first wave. You talked a moment ago about the differences in different parts of the country. And, of course, that's related very much to where students have been gathering and there's been outbreaks there. Uh, looking ahead, of course, quite soon, um, a lot of those students are going to go home to their families for Christmas. Is that a moment of danger for the country when the universities, as it were, empty out across the rest of the country? If we did nothing, um, Andrew, it would be uh, a, a moment of danger 
but that's why I know all universities and um, the Department for Education working closely with them uh, are putting in plans to, to minimise that danger and to mitigate against it. We read this morning that the government is planning to reduce the number of days in quarantine or self-isolation from 14 to 10 or 7. I wonder, has SAGE looked at this at all? Um, I know that there is work going on to look at the length of, of, um, of isolation uh, and certainly it has been discussed uh, at, all, uh, at various times. Um, and I know that in the, the Four Nations uh, there is work and we uh, will be using the results from our uh, large COVID infection survey, uh, which goes back to people uh, over time uh, in order to inform those discussions. Certainly, uh, it is important that, I mean, it's critically important that people self-isolate. Uh, we know from um, a large study by King's College London uh, that um, Around 70% of people say that were they to have symptoms, they um, would self-isolate, but a very much lower proportion who have had symptoms uh, isolate for the full period. So I do think um, really continuing to learn about the virus, continuing to learn about infectivity and continuing uh, to identify um, the, the optimal times for self-isolation is important. Well, it's not important, it's critical because sure. self-isolation is an incredibly important part of, of the way in which we will control this virus. We've talked before about international comparisons and you're quite sceptical about many of them. Where are you now in terms of looking at the, the death rates per 100,000 and so forth between countries? Uh, Andrew, thank you for that. And yes, it is incredibly difficult to make international comparisons. What we have done uh, is we have looked right across Europe where it is possible to have data and to look regionally in, 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 in relatively small regions of different countries and to look at the excess mortality, the deaths over and above the last five year average. What we show there is that the highest peaks, the highest peaks um, were in the first wave in Italy and Spain, in, in regions in Italy and Spain. My point being that our peaks were lower, that the highest um, local region or local area in, in England was only around 11th in the total of European uh, areas, but the national element was critical. Ours, if we can maintain this epidemic a more localised way, then I believe things would be better in terms of our international comparisons. But um, if I look now at what is happening across Europe, if I compare us with France and with Spain, it is remarkable how close our second wave is to the, the curves we are seeing in France and in Spain, we are just four weeks behind France and seven weeks behind Spain. Having said that, um, Spain, which went up very, very quickly, has uh, seen mm. a little flattening later. But I think it's really, really important that we continue to work tirelessly to yeah. flatten our curves uh, much and indeed turn them around, if we can, much quicker than that. So, Ian Diamond, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Andrew, it was a pleasure. Thank you. People living in Wales are entering the second full day of a 17-day national lockdown. A petition to overturn a ban on supermarkets selling items such as books, light bulbs and clothes has become the largest ever submitted in the country, with nearly 50,000 signatures and counting. Labour's Vaughan Gethin, the Welsh Health Minister, joins me now. Uh, welcome, Mr Gethin. This policy is proving hugely unpopular across Wales, by tomorrow morning, you're going to have to tear it up and start again, aren't you? No, we're reviewing with supermarkets uh, the understanding and the clarity in the policy because there's been different application in different parts. What we all need to take a step back on and is to remember why the firebreak has been introduced and to recognise it is hard for lots of people, but we're in a week where we've already seen 61 deaths take place here in Wales. Just about a month ago, there were only six deaths in a week. So coronavirus is taking off. We are seeing more people lose their lives. We've introduced a fire break and a stay-at-home 
set of regulations because we need people to stay at home to break chains of transmission to make sure that we don't see our NHS overwhelmed, we don't see the sort of loss of life we saw in the first wave. Sure. The choices we've made in the government, I know, are difficult. I know they're unpopular for a range of some people, and they're hard for some people. All right. Much, much harder still to explain in a few weeks' time. Well, I, I, I understand that, and, and I'm, going, I'm going to come on to the fire break itself in a moment. But before I do, let's stick with this, because Welsh people going into supermarkets around Wales at the moment, they see things like baby clothes, they see kettles, they see light bulbs, they see books taped off, forbidden to be bought. And that just seems completely absurd to them. Well, it was only on Thursday that the Welsh Conservative Shadow Economy Minister asked for exactly this sort of I don't of care about who asked for it. I just say the policy no, no, seems I'm, absurd. With respect, that, I'm explaining how we get to this point, because he said it would be unfair to smaller retailers who can't sell these items if it's their only area of business. It's the clarity in what is essential okay. and what is. And we've worked with supermarkets. We've had conversations with them about what these items are. We'll talk to them again on Monday so everyone understands the position we're in to have some clarity. And it's also about reducing the opportunity for contacts. Uh, and that's what we're really trying to do. We're asking people to we're asking people to stay at home to save lives. That really is right back where we are. So you say the fewer opportunity the fewer opportunities we have to circulate to go out to shop and to mix and a whole range of other activities we've okay. had to close you, down. You say that's you say, what we're trying to sure. do. You say that it's to stop uh, dangerous contacts. Here's the Welsh Retail Consortium reacting to what you have done. Sectioning up stores, they say, brings huge problems. It restricts the flow of movement, impacting social distancing. This is going to increase risk and harm to our colleagues and to consumers going into stores. I say to you again, it's, it's your policy, it's nobody else's policy, and it, it isn't working. It's hugely unpopular. By next week, are you going to be removing some of those great layers of plastic shrouding huge amounts of goods in Welsh stores or not? Well, all of that florid language, Andrew, doesn't get away from the reality of the difficulties we face that underpins all these choices. And we do know that retailers can actually have a manageable flow going into their stores, as they have done over a period of time, as they've done successfully. And most people understand that there's a reason for having a different set of rules in place. This is hard for people, I know, to see some aisles uh, stopped in some shops and not in others. But we're still having to take a step back and look at the great national effort we all need to make because more people well, are dying. I'm going and to come, that's why I'm going we're to come having to, to intervene picture. yet again. But you can't I, unpick the two, Andrew. I can. If you were, I can. I can well, ask you about well, the specific thing I'm asking you about. I'm going to ask you one more well, time we're, we're, because you say it's to protect we're, we're, local we're, we're, stores, but you also know perfectly well that most people are going to simply go onto Amazon and get these things delivered. So it's not going to protect local stores at all. Well, with respect, Andrew, you, the reason why I say you can't unpick these things is that to have a fire break, the point and purpose of it, to have an effective fire break, we do need to reduce opportunities for people to go out and mix. And that's why we have this, this clarity between what's essential and what's not. Well, and almost all of the retailers where people would like to go into shops have an online offering as well. So it isn't you go to an entirely different retailer. There are lots of stores that do this in any event. And online retail is permissible because that doesn't involve mm -hmm. mixing. So we haven't cut down people's opportunity to buy goods in any form. It's about the in-person activity that matters. And if we didn't make these sort of choices, we know we'd be faced with a different choice, either having a longer fire break with more economic harm, with more challenge let's, to people's mental health and well-being, let's turn or not the, having an effective fire break that would actually mean that more people would lose their lives. Let's, now, let's that's turn, the well, let's turn, that we to make choices in. Okay. Let's turn to the fire break itself, because you have made this a national policy covering all of Wales. But the rates at the moment in Cardiff are around 312 cases per 100,000, which is very, very high. But in Ceredigion, for instance, it's just 33 per 100,000, a tenth lower. And many people in Ceredigion and other parts of Wales wonder why they are having these restrictions imposed upon them, when actually the virus is not transmitting at a very high rate at all in their areas. Why make it national? Well, if we decided to exclude Ceredigion, actually, we'd have had some different issues from a number of people there who, will, who want to see national measures taken. So it isn't, as, it isn't as simple as saying that everybody agrees that one part of the country should be excluded. We also know from the local restrictions we did have covering about three quarters of Wales, that was getting more and more difficult to explain and to get the sort of buy-in that we need to make the rules a success. 
And in the scientific evidence paper that we published on Monday, um, that was the basis upon which we took our decision with advice from our chief medical officer. Okay. That set out that local restrictions had had an impact in slowing down the growth of the virus. So here's, but on their own, they weren't enough. Here's and something it recommended that, a right. national set of measures that would be easier to understand, easier to, understand. to bring right. down transmission in every part of the country. So here's something that a lot of Welsh viewers will want to know the answer to. If at the end of this fire break period rates are still rising, what do you do? Do you impose another fire break? Is there going to be a series of these one after another or is this the only one? Well, we've been very clear that at the end of the fire break, we won't have seen a dramatic reduction in hospital admissions or death rates. We'll see the R figure start to come down below one as we expect it to within another couple of weeks. And that's because, as you'll understand, Andrew, there's a lag between when you take action and when you see it flow through. So the infection rates and death rates, sadly, are a factor of what was happening a few weeks ago. That's why we can see there is more harm coming. And if we don't intervene now, then the 61 deaths and counting this week will not be more next week, but in two to three weeks' time, they'll be even more significant. We're seeing a real takeoff in coronavirus here in Wales with harm being caused. We now have more people right. in critical care than our normal baseline. More than one in four of those are people with coronavirus. So this virus is back. It hasn't got tired. It hasn't got frustrated. It's circulating in every community in Wales. And the All Welsh right. government has chosen to act to avoid much greater harm, much greater loss of people. All right, Vaughan Gethin, thanks very much indeed for joining us this morning. Now then, coronavirus has been front and centre of the US presidential campaign as well. And as the country's leading expert on infectious diseases, Dr Anthony Fauci has also been thrust into this election. I spoke to him on Friday, the day after the final presidential debate, and I asked him why the UK and the US, two developed economies, have been hit so comparatively badly by COVID-19. You know, I don't have an exact explanation for it, but one of the situations that we've had in the United States was a bit of an inconsistency in the response to the outbreak in the sense of getting uh, all 50 of our states of our very large country to actually abide by the guidelines that we set forth. And then when we try to reopen our country, as it were, in the sense of economically, there was an inconsistency in different states of what they did in adhering to the guidelines. So it's a question of a uniform adherence to the public health measures, which we did not do that well here in the United States. So we're in a very precarious position as we're entering into a time when climate will dictate that we'll have to do things more indoor versus outdoor. You know, unfortunately, I, I, I'm sorry to see what I'm uh, viewing from a distance, what I'm seeing in the UK in that, you know, after getting hit pretty badly the way we did, you went down to a pretty low level, but now you're starting to escalate in the same manner that we are here. But we heard at the latest presidential debate, President Trump saying, we are rounding the corner. It will go away. And as I say, we're rounding the turn. We're rounding the corner. It's going away. Is that so? No, it's not. I mean, I, I think it's if you just look at the numbers, I mean, you can have opinions about what's going on, but the data speak for themselves. Yesterday, we had over 70,000 cases, additional cases in a day. And we had about 100, oh, I'd say about 1,000 deaths, excuse me, 1,000 deaths. And if you look at the map of the United States, there are areas that when it gets above a certain percentage that is an indication, percentage of tests that are positive, that is an indication that you're actually going in the wrong direction. So um, I think we really have to, as I say, we don't want to shut down again. There's no, there's no appetite whatsoever in this country for shutting down in any strict way, but there are certain public health measures that you can implement that would go a long way to turning around these increases that we're seeing. But President Trump also said during that debate something that may give a lot of people in America some hope. He said that there would be a vaccine ready for them by the end of the year. You also said a vaccine will be coming within weeks. Yes. Is that a guarantee? Is, no, it's is not this... a guarantee, but it will be by the end of the year. Is that true? I think we will know. Yes, I, I, I believe he said that correctly. We will know whether a vaccine is safe and effective 
by the end of November, the beginning of December. The question is, once you have a safe and effective vaccine or more than one, how can you get it to the people who need it as quickly as possible? So the amount of doses that will be available in December will not certainly be enough to vaccinate everybody. You'll have to wait several months into 2021. But what will happen is that there has been a prioritization set so that individuals such as healthcare workers will very likely get first shot at it, as will then likely people who are in the category of being at an increased risk for complications. That could start by the end of this year, the beginning January, February, March of next year. But when you talk about vaccinating a substantial proportion of the population so that you can have a significant impact on the dynamics of the outbreak, that very likely will not be into the second or third quarter of the year. You've been outspoken about what you call an anti-science bias in today's America. How important is it that politicians and public figures set an example and follow the science? Oh, I think it's very important because, you know, we, we have a situation which is understandable. People look at what their leaders say and do, and you can positively or negatively influence behavior. One of the things I'm concerned about in the United States is that part of the anti-science translates maybe into anti-vaccine, particularly among some of the more vulnerable people like the minorities in our population. It would really be a shame if we have a safe and effective vaccine, but a substantial proportion of the people do not want to take the vaccine because they don't trust authority. That would really be unfortunate if that's the case. Is suggesting that people should inject bleach following the science? No, of course not. I mean, that's obvious. Can you become immune to the virus? Well, it depends on what you mean by immune. I mean, if immune means that you get vaccinated and you develop an immunological response that protects you from getting infected, that is really the fundamental definition of immunity. It's an immunological phenomenon. But the idea that you just are protected for no reason just because you feel you're protected, that's not the case. I think the word immunity sometimes is not used correctly. I ask, obviously, because President Trump has said that he is now immune and he could come down and start kissing everybody. Is that following the science? Um, You know the answer to that. No, (laughs) it's not. But this is really important. When you see big crowds of people without masks milling around and jostling, what do you think? Well, I get concerned by that and I've been vocal about that for some time now that what we need is, and I keep saying it, and that gets back to one of the first questions you asked me, if we uniformly wore masks, kept distance, avoid congregate settings, crowds, particularly without masks and particularly indoors, then if we did those things together with washing hands as frequently as you can, we could go a long way to not only prevent the surges that we're seeing, but to turn around the ones that are already ongoing. It is not that difficult, and you do not have to shut down the country to be successful. Well, Joe Biden said in that same debate that if Americans wore masks, including outside, that by itself could save 100,000 lives by January. Was he following the science? If we just wore these masks, the president's own advisors had told him, We could save 100,000 lives. Well, I'm not sure about the number, but what what the uh, former vice president was saying is true, that if you wear masks and do a simple public health measures like that, absolutely you would save a lot of lives. I don't know exactly how many, but I think it's absolutely correct to say that that would be a life-saving decision if everybody did that. But the president has been clear about the folly of following the scientists. He's criticised Joe Biden for saying that he follows the scientists and said, if I followed the scientists, if I listened to the scientists, we'd have a country in a massive depression. Is he right about that? Uh, No, I don't think so. I, 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 I believe that if we did things in a prudent way, Uh, following the science, opening the country. I I think, again, we get back to what I'm saying, is that there is not an all or none phenomenon. You could follow the science and public health measures 
without shutting down the economy, without shutting down the country. There is this feeling that it's an all or none phenomenon. Either you shut down or you just do whatever you want to do. No, there's a golden mean where you can keep the country going. You can keep the economy going, but you could still practice prudent public health measures such as the ones that I just mentioned. President Trump has put you absolutely at the forefront of his campaign. He's accused you of flip-flopping over masks, and he's also quoted your own words in the recent debate. He says that you said of the virus, this is no problem, this is going to go away soon. Did you say that? No, I did not. This is really important. He said that you said those words, and you say, no, I didn't. So is he lying then? No, I don't think it's lying. I think it's a misinterpretation. Let me explain to you what it was is I was asked um, on January the 20th on an interview in CNN uh, whether or not we should be doing anything different in the country. I said we shouldn't need we do not need to do anything different. And then what got reported was they forgot to include the second half of the sentence. And the second half of the sentence was the first half was we don't need to do anything different right now, comma, however, this could change quickly and we must be prepared because things can get worse. That was on January 20th. That was before the first case was reported in the United States. Once we saw a person to person transmission, I was very vocal about the fact that this could really be a problem that we better do something about. He's also referred to you as an idiot and a disaster. How did that make you feel? You know, I, I got asked that question a lot. I focus on what I feel is a most important mission is to preserve the health, the safety and the welfare of the American people directly and indirectly for the entire world, including the UK, by some of the things we do here. I think those other things are just distractions. If I concentrated on them or let them bother me, I'd not be able to do my job. I have a very important job developing vaccines and therapeutics for this disease, as well as being a public health official to try and get the message out to our country and to the world about the importance of following public health measures. If I got entangled in that other stuff, you know, I, I don't take that personally. I just do my job. President Trump says that it's a good thing that he's in charge and not you, because if he'd followed your advice, there'd be half a million more people dead. Is that figure about right? No, I, you know, I don't want to get into this conversation about pitting me against the president. I need to do my job as a public health official. And, and I, with all due respect, I understand what you have to do and what you're asking. But to go back and forth pitting me against the president isn't helpful for anything, I don't think. Sorry. Now, Joe Biden says that America is heading for a very dark winter. A lot of people are pretty frightened. Uh, given all that you know now, your overview of the situation, at what point do you think America starts to leave this nightmare behind? Well, I think when we get a vaccine and we start getting people vaccinated, that we will have a gradual over a period of several months into 2021, we will begin to approach some form of normality, depending upon how many people, what proportion of the people take the vaccine. And that should be combined with some degree of public health measures. I don't think that a vaccine alone right off will get us back to normality. But what I do foresee is that with a successful vaccine and the continuation of some form of public health measures, as we go and progress through the months of 2021, getting towards the third and fourth quarter, we will see a considerable approach towards some form of normality. Dr. Fauci, thank you very much indeed for talking to us. Good to be with you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Brandon Lewis, the Northern Ireland Secretary, is my final guest this morning. Mr Lewis, can I start by talking about the free school meals saga? We've just learned that Labour is going to have another vote in the House of Commons on this uh, tomorrow. Um, can I ask you what's changed since the summer holidays that means that children who got free school meals then shouldn't get them during the autumn holidays or the Christmas holidays? 
Well, there's a couple of things have changed. Obviously, back um, in the summer, we had all the schools were closed. We had that full lockdown period. Um, things have moved on. We've now got about 99% of schools and children back at school, schools open in the public sector. That's really good. So we are in a different place, but there's more than that. Yes, no, no, I appreciate that, Andrew, but there's, there's more. So the free school meals are there, as they've been since 1906. In the holidays, what we've put in place, actually, is not just the uplifting universal credit, because obviously the schools are closed. So it's about making sure that the welfare system can cover and support what people need. So we've put the uplift into universal credit, around just over £1,000 a year. But also, very specifically, we've put £63 million into local authorities to support and help people in hardship. So very much aimed at so that. And an, all, sorry, Andrew, uh, let me just finish. And a, and a number of local authorities are using it to do exactly that. All of that's been in place since the summer. And I put you that the situation for many people has actually got a lot worse since then. According to the Food Foundation, for instance, 900,000 more children are on free school meals compared to the beginning of the pandemic. We've seen the end of the furlough coming and many other problems over unemployment. For an awful lot of the most vulnerable families in Britain, things are worse now than they were back then, which brings me back to the first question. Why shouldn't they be getting free, free food at, at lunchtimes during the holidays now and at Christmas? Well, as I say, we, we have put in place the support for people in the holidays in this half term, which has just started. First of all, the furlough scheme obviously continues through to the end of October before it changes over to the uh, job support scheme. But that £63 million for local authorities does cover this half term. And we've seen a number of local authorities using it very specifically to support people who need that help for school meals and out of school meals in the holidays, obviously, for children. So we've put that support in there. And that, I think that's the right way to do it because it's, the schools aren't open. So it's making sure that the welfare system can put the support in targeted where it's needed most. Do you think that Conservative local authorities who are offering uh, children free food during the holidays are doing the right thing? Look, they know their area best, so I so fully are. support them in doing what they think so is right. if they're doing area. the right thing, why won't the government support it? Do you know how much it would cost to do this? Well, we are supporting it. We're the ones who put, we've put the, not only the hundreds of millions of pounds more widely that we've put into local authorities to help throughout COVID, but this very specific £63 million that goes through this half-term period, the local authorities can use to do this. It would cost you £20 million a week to end this argument right now and provide the food that these children want and need. Um, you spent £522 million on Eat Out to Help Out and £12 billion on a track and trace system, which you admit as a government isn't working. Surely, in a question of priorities, you've got the priorities wrong here. Well, actually, Andrew, I, I, I would just challenge the premise of that. Because Um, you spent £522 million on Eat Out to Help Out and £12 billion on a track and trace system, which you admit as a government isn't working. Surely, in a question of priorities, you've got the priorities wrong here. committee has said about this. He says combating child hunger should be a cause that all Conservatives can embrace. That should include the temporary extension of free school meals over the holidays while and only while the economic impact of the pandemic continue to be felt. We know that children who regularly eat breakfast achieve on average two higher GCSE grades than children who don't. He's absolutely right, isn't he? Well, and, so, and fighting child hunger and child poverty and poverty generally is absolutely the core of what we said so in our manifesto. Well, two things, Andrew. First of all, as we've said, we want to level up, levelling up, improving education opportunities, improving job opportunities, particularly as we recover after COVID, is absolutely key to ensure more people can have more money to look after their families and put food on the table. But we have very specifically, as I said, put this £63 million into local authorities because they are closest to their communities, to the residents that they serve, can understand what they need to do to target correctly to make sure the people most in need get the financial support that they need in the school holidays. You've you turned on this same policy once before. Isn't the sensible, coherent political thing to do the same thing again? Well, as I say, I think there's a difference. We're in a different position with COVID, particularly with schools being reopened, and we've put this £63 million in to deliver for local authorities to help those in need. And you have the mood of the country, so far as one can tell, against you at the moment. But this is the politics. Let's remind ourselves why we're talking about this in the first place. Here is a mother talking. We wouldn't have survived without it. You worry, you worry a lot about making sure that they've got enough or through the holidays and that. You've got to find that main meal for 
the kids and I think people struggle. She says that she wouldn't survive without it. Surely you're going to have to think again. Well, we do support free school meals. Free school meals are there. This is about, as you said earlier on, about what happens in the school holidays. Exactly. I think the campaign that's been run, Marcus Rashford has started and inspired people with this campaign. Exactly. I think it's huge credit to him for that. It's phenomenal because we all want to see child hunger and poverty but fall. We have put support your, in place. Everyone wants to see more support. You know, private businesses up and down the country, coffee shops and restaurants and shops are giving free, free food to children during the holidays. A lot of Conservative MPs are really worried about this policy. Conservative councils are breaking ranks on this policy. Surely, surely this is the moment for the government to change direction. Well, so I don't think they're breaking ranks. Look, the businesses and organisations that are p putting things out there in the holidays to support families, I think, are doing a great thing for their community. I congratulate them for that and thank them for that. I've seen that in my own constituency in Northern Ireland. But I think it's complementary to what we're doing as a government. We are supportive of that. We support local authorities to do it. That's what this £63 million is there for. And it's not just £63 million, of course, Andrew. It's on top of the hundreds of millions we've put into local authorities to support those most in need. So no U-turn, no change, in a word. Uh, well, look, as I say, I think we've no. got the package in place that means people have got the support they okay. need during school holidays. Let me ask you about something else, which is the story this morning that the government is <clears> looking <throat> at reducing the period of quarantine or self-isolation for people with COVID from 14 days to either 10 or 7 days. Is that true? Uh, well, look, there's no decision. I'm, I'm not sure, here to make yeah. an announcement this morning. The teams are looking at this. As we're learning more about the virus, as we're learning more about how we can manage and live within the virus, so obviously we're always assessing these things, but any final decision on this will be led by the science, and we're not in a position to, to make a decision on that just yet. Indeed, we heard Sir, Sir Ian Diamond talking about that as well. What would be the case for cutting the, the time? Well, it would be looking at whether we can assess that incubation period of the the virus, how people are reacting once we know if they've got the virus and making sure that people understand what the guidance is so they are isolating for the right period of time to protect those in the community around them. Now, we've always assessed that to be around 14 days, obviously 10 days if you've got the virus, but 14 days if you live with somebody um, or being in close contact with somebody with the virus. And it's just whether the, the, the science is able to allow us to narrow that a bit. But we haven't made any decisions sure. on that yet. What the science or the figures at least show is that people um, back in the day, as it were, didn't self-isolate for 14 days. It was very, very hard to persuade them to do so and that therefore the policy may not be working for that reason. I wonder how much people's uh, ability to follow the rules or willingness to follow the rules is behind this cut. Well, we've got, to, as I say, we've got to follow the science to make sure what we're doing is something that helps keep people safe, helps protect our NHS. But you, you've just touched on a really key thing there, Andrew. I think ultimately this is always about for all of us the self responsibility we have to follow the guidelines because the actions we take as individuals impact not just ourselves but also our family, our friends, our communities, and through that the NHS. And we've got to have a structure that people can have. And I appreciate this is a conversation people have, the confidence that we're doing things that are logical and lead forward properly. I mean, you, I saw early on in the show, you have Vaughan Gethin yeah. on. Uh, sorry, Mark Drake wasn't able to come and talk about it himself, but one of the challenges we're seeing in Wales, actually, and very clearly highlighted, is it's become this sort of test bed for left-wing socialist um, authority having, coming out with these crazy outcomes. We've got to make sure well, we don't have that more widely across the country. Let, let, let's return to your authority, as it were. You'll have seen the Sunday Times this morning. A very disturbing looking story about triage and patients aged over 80 not getting the treatment they deserve. Now, doctors and parts of the NHS have hit back about the story, but I want to read you just one quote from it, which seems to me to be a powerful one. This is from somebody called Vivian Morrison, says she was told by her doctors that her 82-year-old father would not be given intensive care treatment or mechanical ventilation because he, quotes, ticked too many boxes, close quotes, under the guidelines the hospital was using. She says he was written off. And there are lots of other examples in that story of people who feel that their elderly relatives did not get the care they deserved from the NHS at that critical time. Look, nobody wants to hear about anybody experiencing something that they feel that meant that they didn't feel they were getting the absolute best care that they can get. And I know people across the NHS have always been focused on giving people the very best possible care. I also know, I have to say, that, uh, that what's outlined in the Times is, as you said, as being roundly condemned by people across the NHS. It's just not what was happening. That What they outline in terms of how the process works is just not correct. There's never been right. that kind of structure okay. out there. But Everybody, the NHS, I, you know, I, I've got a hospital in my own constituency and I know full well that the consultants, the doctors, the nurses who are dealing with people, the only thing they focus on, the key thing they care about of is course. the health of their patients. And I think they're, you know, that's why we've all seen them as heroes over this whole process. There are, I think, 7.3 million people in England alone 
uh, living under the highest tier of restrictions right at the moment. And what they all want to know is how do they get out of them? What are the criteria by which uh, an area in Tier 3 leaves Tier 3? Can you explain? Well, I think it's, it, at the moment, obviously, we're still at that point in the curve of uh, this second wave we're seeing, that we're actually we're seeing areas tending to move into Tier 3 from Tier 2 and some moving from Tier 1 up to sure. Tier 2, as we've seen, including here in London. I think it's too early to start looking and deciding so, about whether people are ready yet to come out of Tier 3, but the teams are continually is looking at it the R rate, or is it something else? Well, it's, it's a mixture of things, Andrew. I've got to say, the, t the, team, the teams work. The same way that they look at whether yeah. an area goes into a different tier, they will work with them around whether sure. they come out, and that's about looking at the whole area. Different so areas, of course, have different the demographies, reason, different geographies, and that does sure. make a difference. The reason I suggest to you that clarity is desperately needed about this is, again, if you're going to hold, keep people with you in this, in this very difficult period, they have to know what the future looks like. They have to know at some point when and why they would leave these restrictions, which are very, very onerous for people. They need, they need to know, therefore, whether it's the R rate, whether it's hospital admissions. Can't you just publish the criteria by which an area in Tier 3 would move out of Tier 3 again, and then you'd have complete confidence and public buy-in. Well, Andrew, I think, you, look, you're right. Some of these restrictions can be very onerous. That has an impact on people. That's why we've been very clear that we want to have a, a balanced approach. We want to avoid that kind of hard level that Labour are pushing for, that we're seeing them implement in Wales. We want to have a more balanced approach that allows people to have some form of normality in their lives, whether it's keeping business going, keeping some shops open. So give them some clarity. But, but one of the things I think, I, look, actually, Andrew, I would, I would say to you, I think people across the country do recognise is this virus, as we've seen it develop and change over the last six, nine months that we've been dealing with this, has different impacts and it does change. As we learn more about it, we're able to do more about it, handle it differently, right. and that's why it's right that we continue to assess this and work with local leaders and local clinicians to assess particular areas. Another thing we've learned just today is that Mr Barnier is going to stay on in London longer than expected until Wednesday, or at least the middle of the week. Does that mean that hopes of a deal with the EU are now rising? Well, look, obviously we would like to secure a good free trade agreement, one that's good for ourselves in here in the UK. Obviously sure, that's I, the prime, that, prime work for us. The fact that Michel Barnier has outlined in the last week or so that they're going to come back to do these intensive negotiations, that he recognises the EU do need to move and that he's staying through to next week is hopefully a very good sign. But we've got to make sure that it's a deal that works not just for our partners in Europe. We want to have a good relationship with them, obviously, but one that works for the United Kingdom. Are you personally more optimistic of a deal now than you were, say, a couple of weeks ago? Well, I'm, an, I'm always an optimist, Andrew, and I hope and I think, I think it's a good chance we can get a deal. But the EU needs to understand it's for them to move as well so that we can get a deal that works for the UK. Right. That's a proper free trade agreement sure. that recognises us as the UK being a sovereign nation. Joe Biden says that he will not give Britain a free trade deal if there is any threat of any kind to the Anglo-Irish agreement. Uh, what's your response to him? Uh, we've always been clear, and I've spoken to a number of US congressmen of, uh, across the floor, actually, over the last few months. Um, we have absolutely protect and abide by the Good Friday Agreement, the Belfast Agreement. It's absolutely key and has done so much to ensure that peace and prosperity in Northern Ireland. And is, is there a we, job of trust? To that. Is there a trust to be rebuilt issue here? Because Joe Biden is clearly completely unconvinced. He's been tweeting about this. You know he was no friend of Brexit. Are you in danger of having, from your perspective, the wrong American president? Well, look, we've always worked very closely with whoever is the president of the USA, and we as a country have got a long, special relationship that's built on a wide range of issues across history. One of them is actually the work we've done together and with the Irish government to ensure we got that Belfast Good Friday Agreement that us and the Irish are co-signatories to. We will continue to protect that. Actually, the actions we've taken through Brexit to protect and ensure free trade across and absolute unfettered access to Northern Ireland businesses to the UK is also about protecting and ensuring no borders for Northern Ireland, East, West or North, South. And we'll continue to work to deliver that. And we are determined to do so and we will. Brandon Lewis, thanks very much for coming in this morning. Thanks to all my guests indeed and, of course, to you for watching. There's more politics where you are straight after this on BBC One. But until next week, goodbye.